Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, unexpected. I'm very honored. Um, sooner or later, somebody will ask me how did I get involved in Riofrol, um, which also means why I'm here um, and why this book came out. So I'm going to tell you right away, um, and which is also a way to explain how this book came into being. Um, then I will tell you what the outcomes of this book so far have been, what they may be, so it's going to be about the before and the after, and also I will tell you why this book I think is, in, is important, certainly not because I edited it, but because of its content. So in 2013, uh, I was asked to contribute a chapter to an upcoming uh, Cambridge history of uh, Indian Poetry in English, uh, edited by Rosinka Chaudhuri uh, for Cambridge University Press. And uh, I was not asked to write just about any, anything, but I was assigned a chapter. And the chapter was titled, uh, originally, Keki Darawalla and his contemporaries. So I wrote back to uh, Rosinka and I say, no, I'm flattered, uh, but what do you mean by his contemporaries? And she said, uh, it's up to you. you. You decide which ones. So I, at that time, the, the table of contents of the book was available. So I, I went through the, no, the rest, the, the other chapters. And basically, all of Daruwala's contemporaries had already a, a chapter assigned. But there were a few missing persons, <coughs> and missing poets that I consider, no. They should have either a chapter or be part of a chapter. One of the missing one was Giv Patel, uh, another one was Kersi Katrak, another uh, Parsi from Bombay. Then there was uh, Chili, Dilip Chitra uh, and uh, uh, Srinivas Rarepral, and the fifth one I don't remember, but uh, it's not important. So I started researching, I said, well, I, I will write about this uh, um, Keki Darwala and these other four. And I started researching. Um, and uh, when I ran into, I stumbled into the correspondence between uh, <coughs> Raya Prol and William Carlos Williams. And I realized that I was onto something that deserved most, more space and it was a different project that um, had to be handled separately. So I, and then I also realized at the same time that five poets was, were too many to write about. So in, in the end, I wrote a chapter called Keki Darawala and, and Give Patel. Uh, and I mentioned Gib Patel because he's a friend of mine. I met him a few times, and uh, and also he was uh, in, in the jury uh, for this year's prize. So there is a connection. Um, so then I, I started uh, researching. I transcribed the letters, as, as, no, the the letters from uh, Williams to Raya Prol are uh, at the uh, Harry Ransom Center, University of Texas. The letters uh, from. Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, letters to Williams are at the uh, Bionic Career and Books uh, Library at Yale University. So I had the copy scan that they transcribed, and then I started looking for a for a publisher. And I, I Paul Mariani, who is the, the, the bi Williams biographer, as well as the biographer of other major uh, American poets, was very much enthusiastic about this project. And he actually put me in contact with the publisher and. <clears throat> They were uh, uh, interested, but they were, um, they read the introduction that I already drafted, and they say, no, there is not much enough about Williams. And I say, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an ex a scholar of American poetry, and how many more, many more books you need uh, on Williams? I'm, I'm a scholar of uh, Indian poetry in English, so uh, I see this as a project that uh, emphasizes this side, and they were not interested. And then the University of um, New Mexico Press, came about uh, and uh, they were very much interested and they were very much in support of, of, the, of, the, of the book. Now why uh, I say that this book is important because uh, for a number of reasons, mostly uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative reasons. On the quantitative side, um, I don't think there is, uh, I think it's the largest a con a group of letters exchanged uh, by a post-colonial Anglophone uh, Indian poet and, and a major uh, Western poet, uh, not only American, but uh, Western in a, in a wider sense. Um, 
a lot of Indian poets and writers corresponded with American and British uh, uh, writers and literary figures, but there are a few letters here and there, Pound wrote, um, others wrote, but um, either they disappeared or, or there are no, very small groups of letters. So here we have a, a literary friendship um, and a correspondence that uh, spanned basically a decade. There are about 30 plus letters surviving. Of course, uh, more, more of Ryapor's letters are missing than Williams's, which makes sense because the younger poet would treasure uh, Williams' letters and he kept them very carefully. Where Williams corresponded with uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people, and um, you know, some of his letters went, uh, went missing. They may still exist. I actually tried um, to identify other letters. I wrote left and right. I wrote to the Lilly Foundation in Indiana. All uh, major um, um, rare books and, and, and manuscript libraries in North America that have significant amounts of uh, modernist uh, poetry correspondence. And the uh, University of Buffalo has a wonderful collection. Uh, I wrote to Berkeley uh, and I wrote to Stanford. And uh, they they don't have anything. So this is uh, something may come up uh, in the future, but this is, um, this is what it is. Um, but it's a very large group of letters. Um, so it's unique. Uh, I consider Rayapol a major uh, post-colonial Anglophone uh, Indian poet. Um, he has received less attention than others for a number of reasons. One is geographical. Uh, he wasn't based in Bombay or Delhi or Kolkata. Uh, the other is no. Partly, I, I think it was his own fault, but this is another conversation. And um, so we have this large group. Quantitatively, I think what is wonderful of these ten years of correspondence um, is two things. One is that it happened in a very interesting uh, uh, time for for Western Eastern cultural history. Um, the fifties were the <clears throat> the coldest uh, segment of the Cold War. So um, there was a sponsorship from America to promote uh, culture in other parts of the world, but it was basically also funded by the CIA and, and kind of ghost organizations. So it was very interesting. And th the part of the correspondence, which is in the book between uh, Raya Prol and James Laughlin, the publisher, and, uh, is actually, you no. Know, overshadowed by CIA connections. Um, Laughlin's not, not Raya Bros. Uh, but the most uh, striking aspect is over these 10 years, this correspondence tells a story. A lot of correspondences between writers and poets are rather dry and technical, or uh, they complain about each other. They, complain, they typically complain about other poets. They complain about publishers. Um, I mean, Raya Prots and Williams complain all the time about actually the very first letter from Raya Prot to Williams uh, is, a letter of, is a letter of complaint. Uh, he's complaining about Ivor Winters uh, because when he started at Stanford and um, he um, as a, a civil engineer in the civil engineer master's program, but he's no, he wanted to write poetry. So the big, the big, uh, the superstar uh, in the English department was Ivor Winters. So he's enrolled, uh, he enrolls himself in the in the poetry writing, and he immediately gets into a, 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 a fight with uh, with Winters. Winters tells him, no, forget about poetry. Um, you don't have the background. Completely ignoring who Raya Prol's father was. Um, but William Winters was no started as a modernist. Then, you know, in, in a very almost religious way, he, 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 rep he was a repentant modernist to turn to formal writing, and he tried to squeeze uh, his students into a formal metrical. Um, his models were Elizabethan poetry, and, and Raya Prol was mature enough from the literary point of view at 21 or 23, whatever it was. Uh, to say, no, they was, that was not what he wanted to write. That, that was not the way that he wanted to write. But the good thing that Winters did, and he said, no, I cannot do anything for you, but no, you should read William Carlos Williams. So, and he does read William Carlos Williams and say, no, this is probably the guy that I want as a mentor. And so he writes to 
Williams and he complains about Winter. Immediately, you know, Williams re replies and complains about Winter. Say, oh yeah, I know the guy. It's, uh, no. And so and so. So it's full of complaints too, but um, which you cannot avoid complaints or uh, uh, writers and poets you know, backstabbing each other. And uh, uh, so that's part of the game. But what is also very touching is the emotional part. So there's this young Indian who um, is supposed to become a civil engineer because that you know, means a social position and a profession, but he wants to be a poet and a writer. So he's looking for this, he chooses this, his own mentor, and Williams you know, uh, is, um, is, is, being a doctor, I think, was part of his personality because doctors you know, listens to uh, their patients' complaints, uh, and they are to be, they are trained or, or their personality trained to be very empathetic so that that component, I mean, if I always think that Williams did not do enough to add as an editor, uh, he gave some uh, good advice, but he could have done more. Uh, and I say, you know, he wasn't, uh, he, he, he would have needed what is called il, il miglior fabbro, which is what uh, uh, Pound uh, called uh, Elliot, or the other way around, I don't remember. So which is from Dante, and, and no, is an, Faber is ironsmith, so, so somebody that no, really beats the iron into shape. So I say, what if, what had happened if, and Ryder Prohl tried to contact Pound. Pound was in jail, uh, was in the mental uh, hospital in Washington, D.C. After, after the war. He tried many times to contact him. I think he wrote to him and he, he wanted to visit him, but it never happened. And I always wonder what would have happened to Raya Prol poetry if he had managed to engage Pound as an editor, uh, as, a, as a reader. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Sharmista Mohanty, uh, the publisher in Bombay, and, and she said, well, you would have a very different poet and you would have a very shorter <laughs> book of poetry. <laughs> Um, the, the human aspect of their correspondence, one poet, one man, the younger man growing professionally, uh, he gets his degrees, is in, no, he's, has a problems about going back to India, no, becoming a civil engineer, getting married, no, starting a family, but that's what he eventually does. And the aging uh, uh, Williams who no, has his first and then second and third heart attack, uh, but he's still very responsive. So the human aspect, uh, I think, is the most uh, touching and the most important uh, aspect of, the, of this book. Um, in addition, it's, I think it's a very important document uh, for uh, literary history. Uh, and I'm very keen, this is my librarian side that comes out, but no, without documents, without preserving documents, you really don't have a liter the, the, the possibility, the material possibility of, of creating a literary history. Otherwise, no, it's just uh, guesswork and interpretation. So since the book came out, when the book came out, and I'm just about to not get to the end, of my story uh, and the book story. Uh, when the book came out, I realized you know, two things. One uh, is going to be available in North America, but doesn't make too much sense. Um, it's going to be just one more book in the Williams bibliography. Most people in America will not know uh, who Ryder Pearl is. And what. The second thing is that uh, even if the book were available in India, uh, Raya Pro's three collection of poetry have never been reprinted. So, um, I mean, you can get scraps of uh, poetry online nowadays. Um, the selected poems is online on the website of the, uh, the Literary Trust. But uh, you really need, um, I keep seeing major uh, Indian poets being uh, reprinted and collected. Uh, uh, works of poetry. Giv Patel's collected poem came out uh, a couple of years ago and so on. So I said, no, this is the time to actually push for an, uh, an Indian edition of the of Raya Pro's uh, collected uh, poetry. And, uh, and Aparna actually found some uh, drafts of uh, prose pieces, a couple of them published and most of them unpublished, and I found them very interesting. 
And, and then we could add also translations from Telugu that he did, uh, both uh, classical and uh, contemporary poets. And there was the material to do a, a good book was there. Um, I have to say that the three uh, originally published collections are so uh, completely full of uh, typos um, and uh, that you run into a situation where you really don't understand uh, what, what's going on and what uh, Ryder Pearl meant. And we all know, know the reputation of Ryder's workshop. Uh, and, you know, the typesetters were uh, typically uh, Bengalis with no knowledge or very small knowledge of English. So some of the typos were, were introduced. Some were already there. And, and, and that's when I say, you know, you know, a, a good editor, a good copy editor uh, would have been a good thing to have, but it, there was not this. Uh, then there were some changes that he, the Ryder Pearl himself made from the previous uh, collection to the to the selected poems. So there was an opportunity to, to actually do a no a good clean uh, work. And what happened is that uh, before uh, the possibility of an Indian edition. And my friend Arvind Krishna Merotra, who was one of the judges in the past, so he's uh, connected to this prize too, uh, who has been very helpful in putting me in contact with, uh, with uh, publishers and other editors. He put me in contact with a British uh, Sri Lankan poet, uh, Vidyan Ravintharan. And Vidyan apparently is very well connected with the two major um, poetry publisher in, in the UK, uh, after Faber and Faber, there's either uh, Blood X and, uh, or Carcanet, and he published with both of them. So he said, no, Blood X may not be interested because they want to publish pub, uh, poets who are, uh, already, who are alive, because they want to come and promote the book. But let's try with Carcanet. And I said, oh, Carcanet is oh, quite a publisher. And immediately they were interested. Michael Schmidt said, no, let's do the book. So that that got into production uh, first, and is actually is coming out in March. I just corrected the proofs. Um, I was very happy of, uh, Vidyan is co-editing the book. I was very happy because he has been a finalist for the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Forward Prize. And he's been, uh, he used to teach at Birmingham, University of Birmingham, and be snatched by Harvard, and he's starting to teach at Harvard. So the connection with him actually raises my, <laughs> my reputation, too. For the Indian uh, edition, we uh, got a commitment from Copper Coin in Ghaziabad in Delhi. Uh, they are a little bit behind schedule, uh, but uh, they promised to send me the proofs uh, by the end of February. So, uh, hopefully, it will be published uh, within the year. The content is about the same. The Indian edition has a few uh, more prose pieces. Uh, the title is different. The, uh, the British edition will be um, is called Angular Desire. From uh, I, I think I I chose the title and Vidyan was okay. I think it's an excellent title. Uh, it comes from probably one of the most famous poems by Ryder Pearl, Oranges on a Table. Uh, the Indian edition is going to be called Ra Random Harvest, uh, which is, uh, Aparna tells me, is the, the title that uh, uh, her father would have chosen for, uh, uh, for the edition that he was planning to make. So we are respecting his, his will. Um, now we have to, uh, I have to pursue the opportunity, uh, the possibility of doing a, an Indian edition of uh, the correspondence with Williams, and uh, hopefully you know, we'll find I have a few options, and uh, that's my next goal. And then I will be riot prolled out for a few years, <laughs> because otherwise it's going to become suspicious, this involvement. Um, I, I've been writing an essay on one of his poems, Nagarjuna Konda, and I hope to publish it in a journal, uh, but it's not finished yet. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It was, it's very kind of you, of the Raya Prol family, to invite us today. And I'm honored because I've always enjoyed Srinivas Raya Prol's poetry. And I'm truly touched when I read this correspondence, the generosity of spirit with which these two people approached each other, uh, the responses taking time and effort. When you have to write a letter, it means that you've got to select paper, you've got to do that writing, you've got to think what you're saying, you've got to then post it to each other. And this was something that they sustained as an act of poetic support, offering support and, and, um, and camaraderie.
comradeship in the, in the you know both of them were working at the salt face of the word both of them had the same kind of uh, problems dealing with language and with publishers and with life stories etc etc and they reached out to each other as strangers that i think is the magic of of what the best of us there is a horrible part of being a poet as well nasty be bits of work we are sometimes but the best of us is this moment when we can reach out across the worst of ourselves and offer friendship to somebody in the form of a literary prize like the Srinivas Rai Pro literary prize or in the form of letters of support so we thought what we'd do is i'd play uh, william carlos williams and uh, ashwarya would play srinivas rai pro and we'd read a selection of the letters um, the book unfortunately is not available in india yet but we you should see it as a wetting of the appetite note it note it and when it, the indian edition happens i'm sure you should all get a copy um ashwarya take it away hello yeah um i'm um reading a letter that was sent by uh, uh shrinivas rai prol to william carlos williams in 1949 and this is the time when he's still calling him dr williams somewhere along the line he starts calling him bill um So I'm just going to start now dear Dr Williams this letter is long overdue some day ever since i came across your writing i have wanted to write to you you at least have been able to connect the prose and the passion in life you're not only a good poet but perhaps an excellent doctor is that why you write such a thing of startling beauty as and i quote um, by the road to the contagious hospital under the surge of the blue mottled clouds driven from the north east a cold wind so that's a quotation of uh, carlos williams poem but why all this you'll say uh, i'm continuing with the letter that rai prol uh, writes i'm a student of engineering and indian and 21 i'm terribly confused because i want to write poetry and when i return to india within the year within the next year i'll have to make a choice or can one connect like you perhaps you'll understand the why of my admiration for you you solved a similar problem i do not know at any rate i know this for certain even while i write this to you i know that no one can help me in my problem but myself but this letter has to be written it is as insistent as a poem and if you write to me perhaps that that in itself may be a form of peace Meanwhile I enclose two poems of mine you can judge them for what they are worth of course I've not been published yet everybody is kind there is a force but no form as if to say he's uh, quoting what other people say about his poems as if to say you're not ready also I attend a poetry class under Mr Ivor Wint Winters uh, he does not approve of my poems I do not approve of his theories but he is the most intelligent man i have met in this country besides he affects me in, he affects in me a strong father complex hence i try to please him i even write heroic couplets they are just terrible so what do you say at least if this reaches you and not some dreadful secretary you'll try to understand uh you know you want to hug him yeah I really, really want to really feel you, like when he says I'm 21, I don't understand. I want to connect. You really feel like there's a and that poem is not just. I mean, that letter is not just a letter. It's an expression of the confused and and uh, bumbling self we've all been at some point. Uh, William Carlos Williams writes back, and it's also a masterly work. It's a pleasure to have you come to me with your problem. Not that it isn't a problem with all, us all. all to know what to do with our lives but in the case of a young poet it is more normal than anything to be situated as you are the solution is without solution except writing if you write well you have the solution in your hands if you write poorly there's an end of it every man must live as he may i was talking to my wife at breakfast when your letter arrived i read it handed it to her and she read it she smiled what are you going to tell him i'm going to tell him to marry a wife like you i said politely 
Winters is an old acquaintance by letter. You don't need to discuss either his critical position or his methods of attack. I disagree with him top to bottom as heartily as you. His very intelligence seems to unseat him. It is not necessary for you to follow him. The whole point is that versification is at this moment and necessarily in a state of flux preparatory for a realignment on a broader basis. To fix oneself to standard metrical forms or neoclassical meters is to destroy the whole basis of present day opportunity. You are aware of this and so you distrust winters. Search for your own metrical unity and learn through a lifetime to unite its elements into alignments suitable to your mental and emotional climate wherever you happen in your life to fix your orbit. Go on from there. You are on the right track. Have courage and keep an eye to the windward. Feels like he's talking to you, no? Yeah. Someone has got to find the new way. It may be you. Your poems I take for what they are, beginnings. Write again if you want to. For, for those who may not know, uh, I just wanted to gently remind uh, that William Carlos Williams was an imagist poet uh, and he was doing something very, very different uh, at that time uh, in English poetry, in American poetry, which is, you know, writing free verse, of course, which had been done before, but also really focusing on constructing an image that speaks for itself without any overt speculation or moral, uh, you know, tone on the substance, no messaging uh, in the poem itself. And therefore, uh, his uh, opposition to the heroic couplet and, you know, Ivor Winters, which, um, you know, Mr. Graziano spoke about earlier. Okay, I want to read another um, letter, maybe some extracts from it, because it's a, it's a long letter from 1950 that, um, you know, Raipurul writes, um, it's on Palm Sunday. And here he addresses um, Williams as Bill. Dear Bill, all along the streets you see people dressed. The air is without stir, the general feeling one of conformity more than anything else. But then what else is religion and even life, if not one of peaceful conformity? In India, the equivalent festival would have spread its odors and noises all over the air. There would be symbols and incense, there would be chattering people, there would be such a smell of belief in the air that you would be choked by it, or you could be choked by it. In India, people participate in religion, here they conform to it. Hence, you have religious riots in India, and here you have quick dissent, or at the loudest, a papal excommunication. I have not learnt to conform to life. Certainly as time passes and I old myself into maturity, I am sure I will. But religion, never I suppose. I have no doubt that religion will exist in much the same manner as now for the rest of my life and I doubt if my attitude will change well. Um, I am skipping a paragraph. Um, Okay, and in spite of all my moments of strength, I do feel so small and petty. Example, the other day, I let my admiration of Frank Lloyd Wright's architectural principles go out in such loud enthusiasm that someone in the car, we were dri driving home from work, and I had an issue of the architectural forum dedicated to Wright's work, which I was using to illustrate my assertions, said that he would hate to disillusion me, but Wright was a notorious queer. I don't know what my reaction to such a mean statement should have been, but I think I came out with an equally small remark. What irritated me was the fact that people seemed to collect only the notorious points about a great man and weigh them all against his better assets. That anybody, sh that, that anybody should be judged on one's sexual morals in a country like America in the 20th century shocked me. But basically, I had returned a petty remark with another such, I had neither the strength nor the discretion to be quiet about the things that impressed me in life, etc. I felt ashamed all day, all that day. But I'm sure if another occasion came, I would just as strongly defend your work or Rilke poems or Picasso's women. I'm not strong enough to overcome this shameful weakness. And however much I've learned that over-admiration of the object can harm the object, 
I've never been able to be subdued in my likes and dislikes. Yet you deny that you're a great man. Humility, goodness, and a general objective kindness toward the world, I found the first two in your person and the third in your work. What else then is greatness? I don't know and don't care. And even now, the differences between you and Winters are clarified for me. Winters is like my father. They do resemble each other in many ways. Was always conscious of his age over mine, of his superior knowledge and learning over mine. And whenever we met, it was with, with the proverbial parent-son shadow hovering in the backyard. Winters wanted to run me through a groove outside of which he felt no poetry could be written. And my father wanted, me, wanted to make a successful man out of me. And he felt quite truly, I suppose, that every man should have enough to live. As such, I should study engineering and not literature. And it seems I'm falling out of both their patterns and forming one of mine. You never tried to deviate me, but rather gave me the first sense of intellectual freedom. For that, I can but thank you so much lesser than you deserve. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read the rest of There's the... There's another lovely excerpt now that uh, I think uh, I was thinking this morning. It was amorphous in my head in the morning, but here's uh, William Carlos Williams actually saying it. There is something wrong about reading poetry in public. <laughs> Either the room is wrong or the people who come are wrong. Or perhaps they only seem to be because of the mutual embarrassment that comes from trying to speak in public of a thing that by its very nature is intimately personal and needs to be warmed and loved to thrive as it should. You can't, you can't, sorry, you can't shout poems over the footlights, not at least all of them. Some can be read in a loud defiant voice, but others, almost all, require close attention and preliminary agreement of some sort. I can't imagine Homer reading in a hall. He must have read in villages or in small circles. What happens is that we automatically select the obvious or pass quickly over a delicate, questionable passage. In a play, we might do better with our verse, but I doubt it now. There is too great a temptation to exaggerate. I mean, anyone who's read a poem in public, this is such a gorgeous, like, it is Dilki Chen. It is like something patting you in your, on your heart and saying you're not alone. Can I just do another little yeah, bit sure. then? I love this moment when finally, um, you know, William Carlos Williams is getting into the spirit of actually getting into the grips of, with Raya Prol's poetry. And what a feeling it must have been to receive this letter back. To have William Carlos Williams reading your poems. It's like you remember, uh, Priya, you telling me Adil Jasawala reading your poems when you started writing again. Like taking you line by line through every... This thing was like a bouquet of flowers, she said yesterday. It was like that kind of gift. And this letter must have been so... Like so wonderful for, uh, for Srinivas. Who, I'm calling Srinivas because he's a buddy also. Yeah. That's a strange poem called Returning at the bottom marked for William Carlos Williams. I can't make it out in any literal sense. Don't bother to explain it. It would be foolish to explain it, for it has, I am sure, acquired a meaning of its own, associated with distance, the recalcitrance of all things, even poems as things, toward any meaning which we try to fasten upon them. But this thing is disturbing for no reason that I can discover. Don't let me try to place upon it a meaning which isn't there. And it still remains confused. The Jesuit is another. There is a neatness about your work that, is in a, that in a sense I don't like. And yet what can you do? Precision is doubtless your greatest talent. Such a liberating thing to say. I don't like it, but you've got a great talent for it. Stay with it. You know, this is, it's really like having the perfect mentor. I don't like it, but you, you can do it, you do it. Wow. Um, yeah, for him. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this next letter, um, Rai Prol writes from Sikandrabad uh, in 1954. Um, Dear Bill, how the time flies. Your letter was of October 26, and here I am some six months later trying to reply to you. 
you whom I could hardly wait for a reply from. But not from any indifference, let me assure you. Circumstances and the busyness of my present day living conspire to dim the fondest of memories that when the thought does come on a sudden like a storm, the sad reaction stays on for days like a numb pain. Uh, and then there's a poem uh, that he sends. Why should I write a poem now that most of me is dead in the act of living? That the long fingered trees which reached the snow to my early bed stand now rooted to the earth. So I started the other day. Yes, Bill, most of me is now dead. I'm leading the sober, unexciting life of an engineer in government service and trying, of course, to be as good in it as I'm equipped with. I'm making a good husband, a good friend, a good citizen. Call me Mr. K. But that is only the skin of me. Scratch it and you will find me self-conscious and overfull of humility, sensitive to the point of pain, intellectual and uneasy. My present living seems something false, a fixed period of slavery which I am serving and from which when I am liberated, I will fly me off to the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State, there to be there to be part of the million perversions and million excitements which myself is really constituted of. Ah, nuts, Bill, I'm lonesome for the place by the fireplace at Nine Ridge Road, where I discovered my self-decided parent, and a lonely cold night at Nine Ridge Road where Mrs. Williams brought me an extra blanket. I remember most what I must need to forget. After having got a poem of mine in the Indian supplement of the Atlantic, I have become sort of known in my own country and editors have started asking me for some little contribution. And looking for some in my papers, I find one or two letters of mine written to you but never posted in the USA, which I find flattering to my ego and fascinating reading from the point of view of an Hindu discovering the civilization of the 20th century Western world. One of them written after an Easter Eve party at the Cosgriffs in Denver, one after a visit to a clay exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, which makes me want to publish them. I mean, we're reading his pub, you know, published letters now. Um, you often wrote to me that you'd wanted to include one or two of my letters in your AB, and finally couldn't due to lack of AB space. is autobiography. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, couldn't due to lack of space and time. Tell me, Bill, would you, could you please edit my letters to you, which are with you for publication? Do you think people would be interested in reading them? Do you think they make the grade all right? I'm interested in getting them in Bottig, Oscure, or New World Writing published by the New American Library of World Literature or in the New Directions Annuals, something under the title Letters to an American Poet. Perhaps you wouldn't be able to spare the time or the energy. Please let me know. I've started writing again, mostly prose though, and meanwhile I'm trying to get together a taut, small volume of verse. Tell me, Bill, do you think it's worth while my living as long as you? And what have you written lately? And have you fallen in love lately? My last love was the snow in New York City or the narrow stone bridges on the, on the Seine. Can't just make up my mind. Else, why don't you adopt me so I can come and see you both, ever, Sina? Okay, this is a moment also that reminds me, you know, letters are also performances. When you are writing to a, a great poet like William Carlos Williams, you know that you are entering into literary history in a certain way. And this is a beautiful moment when there's a simultaneity of, of, of uh, the performance and the intent of the performance which is given. And it reminds me of a moment when Ranjit Hoskote and I decided to write letters to each other <laughs> because we wanted to become part of literary history. But we wrote such posy letters to each other, you know, like we were both performing literature at each other. They were not letters at all. And we soon gave up the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, try, the attempt. But here is a lovely answer. Dear Sina, and Sina is the way uh, an American thinks of Srinivas. You know, he apologizes for writing the wrong name and then calls him Sina again. Okay, but anyway, it's that sweet. Dear Sina, it is a good thing to write when nothing else seems to offer any comfort, even though we know that even writing is only a stopgap to keep us from thinking. 
It's a confession of our weakness. Why ever do we write anything? Your state of mind is only an exaggeration of the state of mind of every writer or musician or painter. It at least pushes the distress away from us. If only to arm's length for a moment, and so we play on it for a moment as a pianist on his piano. We do not at least permit ourselves to fall in amongst the keys. And so writing is good. I think that's where we'll stop now. Yeah. Clap properly, man. I'm the question that uh, Srinivas Rai Parul asks in one of his letters, which was read here, and is so uh, poignant and perhaps so crucial. The question of why should I write a poem now? Uh, it's a question that almost holds you by your collar and demands an answer. It is a question which, as uh, Rai Parul said about a letter, is as insistent as poetry itself. It's an insistent question and it's a pertinent question and it's a question that I hope as poets we always think about. Uh, why should I write a poem now? Uh, this is a question that I keep asking myself and uh, I'm, the answer that I have, the only answer that I have perhaps is because poetry is utterly beautiful. It is a thing of beauty and as Keith said, what is beautiful is really true. And I think because it is so beautiful, it is hard to ignore. And we really need really beautiful things to m make us stop being indifferent to what is happening around us and what is happening inside us. Just this morning, I was uh, sitting amongst a group of people who were almost in a in a stark comedic way, uh, joking about NRC and CAA and all that is happening while I was, I was just sitting and I was thinking, what is the role of poetry now? What is the role of poetry now? Is there anything that I can do as a poet to bring a thing of beauty and which can perhaps cut through this, uh, this sort of insensitivity? which can cut through or perhaps say something which is beautiful and true. The poignancy of the fact that I'm receiving this award in the hands of Graziano is not lost on me. Uh, today, as we are celebrating the work of a poet, we are also celebrating a work of a librarian and uh, who has worked so tirelessly in excavating and preserving the culture of poetry and as Jerry said, a culture of generosity, sheer generosity between poets. And if poetry can do something in this really ungenerous times, it is perhaps to create a sense of generosity. And uh, the poignant, I call this uh, particular moment poignant because I have to say this, it's not a way to sort of get attention about something, but I have to say this because of who I'm also addressing. Because of what happened on De December 15th in Jamia Millia Islamia, where tear gas bombs were thrown into the library compound. And at that point, if as a poet who has spent most of his time in the library, learned all that he has perhaps in the library and <clears throat> what, do, what do we do in the face of it? What kind of poem do we write in the face of that? Um, I have written a poem. I don't think uh, it is in any way uh, a making sense of it, but in fact it is almost uh, an irritation, irri a poem that is born out of an irritation a poem which is also refusing to stick to the narrative which is being spun. And it is a poem where this library, unlike, I mean, what the fascist state would want libraries to be, is never going to die down. This is a poem called Library of Olan, and I'll start with that before I continue. This poem is called Library of Olan. It's a legend that I have imagined about a library which 
is magical and hopeful even in trying times. The library of Olan turned upside down the moment bombs of tear gas were thrown into its dusty rooms. The intention was to smoke out the few who refused to leave their obsession of biting into tomes and licking the pages of ancient erotica. Despite all the carefully crafted distraction, there were few romantics who held on to the humor of books and the pleasures of marginalia. So smitten and surprisingly entertained were they that the police thought of making them cry, hoping that sad and dejected, they will give up their long exile with words. It is now a historical fact that the opposite happened. They went mad with pleasure at the prospect of reading with eyes perpetually filled with tears. The words became mistier, more enigmatic, and the sentences would dance like waves. Even scientific manuals seemed to carry the depth of rivers, and they could now easily laugh till they cry at the fascistic stupidity of great poets. When the news went out, the people in large numbers began migrating to Olan and queuing up outside the library gate to experience what they claimed was an altered state of emotion, a chance to feel the things they have never felt in ways that they have never imagined. The entire weight of dialectical philosophy could be felt at the smallest turns of phrases. Even the most basic comedies were now laced with a tinge of melancholia. The artificial gas tears made it possible to call the to call out the manipulation of sentimental lyrics and the longing to cry out of will and not force intensified the empathy for star-crossed lovers. In the constant state of deferred catharsis, Aristotle's complex thesis about dramatic structure came undone. Disregarding the causal root of plot, readers started wandering in the bylanes of unimportant scenes looking for characters without arcs. When inside the library, people exchanged glances, they were overcome by the realization that while they may be crying similarly, they all radically differed in the ways they were feeling, sensing, living, and loving at any given moment in time. The acknowledgement of such an intimate distance was so poignant that the library sunk into a deep silence without the librarian's interruptions or signs of strict instructions. If you visit the library of Olan today, you will find that the carpets register the traces of your footsteps as gently as the sand on the seashore does. If you touch the wooden bookshelves, you'll wonder how they didn't rot despite being so damp for so many years. If you turn the pages of any book, you'll be able to run your fingers not only over the printed words, but also over the lasting pattern of fallen tears. Um, another thing that sort of uh, leapt out at me when I was reading some excerpts of the Raipiro letters was the sense of um, isolation that he was also feeling, a sense of lack of community, but we also know that it is out of that solitude that sometimes poetry emerges. And I think a very particular perspective that Rai Parole had on the most ordinary things. Um, I remember this poem where he talks about trees not shedding their overcoats. And it's, it's such a beautiful sort of observation. I think uh, angular desire is also such a wonderful sort of way to look at how what the gaze of the poet is perhaps, as Emily Dickinson says, tell the truth but tell it slant. And uh, it's really uh, perhaps that sort of quality which uh, sometimes solitude and exile and even being at odds with the majority or the community brings in somebody. Uh, I have also, however, been very fortunate to not feel that lack of community 
um, it is thanks to a lot of people, starting from my parents, uh, who, uh, I mean, it's, I've said so many things about them in so many ways that it's hard to find newer and newer ways to thank them. Uh, but uh, I think I'll uh, start with, um, I'll say this, that my father was the first person who brought, who brought me my first copy of Prem Chand. Um, and uh, he also had a wonderful habit of borrowing books from friends and never reading them. So thankfully the books would enter the house and be lying there unread. So that's how I read Anna Karenina, Maxim Gorky, uh, and down to all sorts of books, including Upamanyu Chatterjee till, you know. So he would get all these books and not read it or partially read it. And then I would somehow, you know, read it and then flick them away from the shelf. His friends have lost lots of books because of me. Uh, so that's what I'll say about him and my mother. Uh, is very, plays a very special role in especially poetry because uh, she always wanted to recite poetry. She said that she used to sit in the audience when recitation competitions would go on in school and she, would, she had this real desire to be on stage and recite poetry but uh, she said that I was very nervous and I was very unconfident but when I was born and when I started going to school, my mother really made sure that I participated in recitation competitions. And uh, she was the first person who taught me how to recite a poem. And um, it is, a, I mean, she's not here today uh, with us, but I think I have carried that enthusiasm for life and poetry um, through her. And I'm, I'm deeply thankful, I'm deeply thankful for for her. My brother uh, Nishant, who is such a quiet soul, we don't talk much, but I think there is such a deep camaraderie. He's the only one in the family now. I, thankfully, I have a comrade within the family to fight my father against Modi. So it's a great, uh, <laughs> it's a great uh, feeling, thankfully. I mean, otherwise I would have been really isolated. <laughs> so uh, that's another uh, thing which is, uh, well, I'm really thankful for. But apart from family, the other thing which uh, has happened to me are my friends and lovers. Uh, it was it's such a beautiful sort of feeling to be uh, in company of friends and who have who've played a very different role. They have not only comforted me actually, every single good friend of mine and every single lover of mine have challenged me to the core to really rethink my own assumptions, my own personality uh, and I think they have done a very crucial part as uh, Kabir says, we were discussing yesterday in the session that Kabir says that you know sometimes the pot should break, uh, only then will there be any sense of you know. So I think whatever you grow up with becomes a very neat constructed pot and when I sort of travelled for education etc, made new friends. I think the pot was broken by them because they asked me really challenging questions and without that, that sort of piercing hammer, uh, it's very hard to bring out the shine and stone. So I think it's, uh, I'm really grateful for, for the friends, for their generosity, especially Naveen and Shobna who were my teachers and then they became my friends who introduced me to poetry. Naveen gave me my first copy of a Hindi translation of a Polish poet, Visawa Shimboska, and that like completely changed my life. And then when I was in college, Shobna from the English Department of Christ University was my first teacher. She really cracked poetry open for me. And incidentally, the poem that completely turned my view of poetry upside down was This Is Just To Say by William Carlos Williams. And it's such a serendipitous thing that we are talking about William Carlos Williams today. Uh, I think and um, yeah, uh, I'll read another poem. So I'll, I thought I'll intersperse my thank yous with poems so that neither of the two gets boring and monotonous. <laughs> so I'll read another poem. This poem is called Body Nation. And this poem too is uh, well, I'll, I'll not say what it is about because it's unnecessary. Uh, this is a poem called Body Nation. The country of my body has passed a farman, signed by the head 
the thumb forced to attest with two eyes as witnesses, I no longer belong here. My ears have no patience for my language. My tongue repeats the same silent songs. Caught between rage and heartbreak, it is unbearably dry. But my hands have decided that they will not offer a single drop of water, poison, or prayer. I have now come to know for sure that the taste of the tongue, that the tongue, sorry, I have now come to know for sure that the tongue holds on to the abandoned most dearly. That taste is the last sense you lose. Once while kissing the earth in prayer, I had erred and stuck my tongue out. Today, I'll do as ordered. Here, I'm giving up the thick taste of soil that happens to be my final memory. Here, I'm bidding my body goodbye. Here, I'm kissing it one last time. My lips are so cold that this ample body nation, once mine, now yours, catches fire in shock. I'll see from a distance with cold nerves, flesh returning to ashes. Thank you. Um, and now, finally, I want to thank um, uh, two institutions, uh, Mara and Kabir Project, who, uh, Mara is an arts collective in Bangalore, who I worked with for a year and made uh, some really lasting friends and enemies there. I think I quarrel with them the most politically. Uh, sometimes I, I'm amazed how much we can quarrel when there is a, when there are bhakts around, you know, like, I mean, despite that, we can quarrel so much amongst each other, even when we are on the same side. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Mara, who, which really nurtured me and gave a sort of different kind of opening uh, to look at the city of Bangalore especially and to put me very in great proximity to poets, uh, sorry, to politics, but also poetry and cinema. Uh, that's, Mara is also the place where I heard lots of stories about Jerry, incidentally, through Ekta Mittal. <laughs> so that's another sort of like a happy coincidence. And the second place, Kabir Project, which has just sort of um, overturned my life in a very interesting way. I had grown up uh, reading a no poetry. Then I started reading a lot of English and American poetry. And then when I came to Kabir Project, of course, I'd read some bit of bhakti poetry before, but when I came to Kabir Project, it opened up such a vast variety of poems, which were not the traditional Indian poems from the Brahminical fold, so to speak, but uh, they were poems from Kabir, Meera, Sufi poems from Bulle Shah, um, Amir Khusro, singers, Kavali singers from Pakistan, to, to encounter poetry in song, and be so moved with it, I think that also shifted the way I was writing poetry uh, very significantly. And more than that, Shabnam um, and Kabir Project and Shrishti have been such dear sort of supporters of my craft. Um, I work uh, freelance with Kabir Project and I still don't have a full-time job. But I think it's through Kabir Project which I, where I always sort of find some bit of grounding in life apart from finances, <laughs> thank you. But uh, I've, I've managed to be independent because of institutions like Kabi Project, which really value uh, the work of an individual and what an individual can bring to the project. Um, through Kabi Project, I have started developing courses on poetry. I've got a chance to teach uh, Kabir, which I never thought I would, but I mean, it's such a joy to uh, be in such places. And finally, Finally, um, I want to thank Shruti, uh, my partner, and uh, I don't know what, what can I say about uh, this relationship because it's one of those relationships which really sort of uh, broke the core of my personality to the point where I could literally feel afresh 
uh, I could literally question every single thing and arrive at some deeply, deeply important questions. More than providing answers, this is one sort of person who has filled my life with, and I'll say this, beautiful questions. And I think she has taught me how to question. And I think it's, although I've been, I thought I'm questioning for a long time, but sometimes you also need somebody to tell you what the right questions are. And I'm, I'm deeply sort of grateful to it. And I think what uh, we also together started Brown Study, which is a sort of oasis for me and which is what sustains our practice, which is where we find our voice and our, um, our hope in these extremely sort of sometimes hopeless times, but we are very hopeful people. And we are very hopeful because we know that sometimes things have to really break for any creation to happen. And uh, I'm going to read a last poem of mine, which is called Kintsugi. And I think this idea of Kintsugi encapsulates what I also feel about art and poetry. Kintsugi is a Japanese art of uh, when ceramic bowls break down, those pieces are collected, and then the pot is rebuilt using gold. So it's a process of making something broken even more beautiful than perhaps it was, not by hiding its cracks, but by really intensifying its cracks. And I think that's what art does. Art does two things. One, it breaks the molds that we've been living with all our lives. It makes us confront the breakdown of things, the questioning of uh, things which, have, which we have considered, you know, accepted. And second is, to, is also the process of healing through generous, compassionate, empathetic expression, space, listening. It provides a way for broken things to heal. So this process of Kintsugi which sort of does both. And I feel that one experience which does both these things is the experience of love. And my only sort of goal as a poet, I feel, in these hyper-nationalistic times is to always continue to write love poems. So this is one such love poem called Kintsugi. Um, the first green of spring, the gentle pink blossoms, have announced your arrival in this city of mine. In this city of mine, lean-bodied men have stopped their work midway, in the middle of a busy afternoon. They are listening at present to the symphony of their transistors being tuned to catch an unknown melody amid distortions, horns, signals, and impatience. A half-turn flyover hangs dangerously over them. They've given up the mending of roads and large billboards, are either empty or draped with incomplete pictures. Buildings, roses, promises have all been left undone. I know you have arrived. The stars have come out of their hiding. The moon has forgotten her cycles. The calculation of her periods is a mess. All the women have stopped sleeping at night to look out of their windows at the streets to catch your shadows and listen to the rhythm of your unruly steps. I know you passed by my street last night. Newspapers have turned shockingly banal. Soaps have lost their plot. Characters in stories are loitering without purpose on pages which smell neither new nor old. Lilies have entered the kitchens. Violets have returned to the soil. Priests are reading haikus and clerks have stained their hearts blue. In their pockets, pens have started leaking and birds are flying in their dreams. You will leave without paying visit again. Once again, you'll make incisions from a distance and forget about suturing. You'll leave a taste of longing on our tongues for the whiff of your skin or the toes of your feet. Our fingers will be scanning the surface of our realities for remains of your golden hair 
and needles of your unsaid words, we'll once again mend our porcelain selves, fill all the cracks with gold and pain. We'll make ourselves beautiful for you to break us again. Um, finally, I just wanted to end this session with a translation that I did of a Faiz Ahmed Faiz uh, poem, which I felt compelled to read today because it's a prayer and perhaps it sounds very much, is a Pakistani poet uh, and it's perhaps very important for us to read prayers in these times, but prayers which are, as Faiz says, not of the religious. Uh, so this is a translation of a face poem called Dua, which starts, as, which starts with the line, Aye haat uthaye. So I'm just going to read the translation. A prayer. Let us also raise our hands in prayer, we who have forgotten all the rules of praying, we who are struck by the passion of love and have no patience for the sanctity of gods. Let us file petitions to dig up a thing of beauty, something to fill the cup of today's poison with sweet whispers of tomorrow. For those crumbling under the weight of daily trials, let us unburden their days and let the nights fall more gently on their soft lashes. For those who have confused lies for faith, let us wish that they be granted the strength to disbelieve and the curiosity to question. For those bowing down, unaware of the swords of their guardians, let us wish that they be granted the will to disobey and the power to walk away. Let us publicly declare the hidden secret of love. Let us put the longings of our hearts to rest the words of truth that prick the insides of our being, let us bring them out into the open and end this suffering. Let us also raise our hands in prayer, we who have forgotten all the rules of praying. This tangles with power that be is not new, their rights of oppression are not new, and our will to resist is very old. We have pulled flowers out of embers before. They will lose again. We will win again. There is nothing unusual in this. We don't complain endlessly to the skies about this mess. For when we think of you, Evatan, we choose not to be bitter. Thank you. If I can, as a sort of sign-off, I would like to remember uh, two other women my two grandmothers, uh, one grandmother who really, really wanted to be with me, my father's mother, uh, Nainama, and one other woman, Amama, who passed away when I was very young. She's somewhere far, far away. But she's, I think, one of the persons who influenced me the most. And in, this, in that very sort of formative years, with her sheer gentle presence, uh, there are two small Hindi poems, which I remember by heart, just three lines each, uh, about the two of them. Uh, one, uh, Aakash ke tukde nahi hote, har tukde ka apna aakash hota hai. Nani ke chhajje se asman ko dekho, nani ka suti aachal nazar aata hai. And uh, the other uh, poem is for my dadi. Dadi, tum itna tez chal kar bhi, itna kam kaise chalti ho? Beta, tum meri gati nahi, mere pair dekho, chote hai. Thank you.